One of the guests, by the way, who we're bringing in is no stranger to this program or the nation in, as a, in general. Sheila Bear, Volker Alliance Director, is joining us now because Sheila has published on our Yahoo Finance webpage um, a column two weeks ago that people should pay attention to. It has to do with banks and not only the uh, leverage uh, ratios that they have, but also the risk ratios that they have and how the system might be, quote, gamed and put you and me as taxpayers on the hook. Sheila, I don't know if I described that accurately, but can you help us understand what's at stake here? Yeah, so, uh, yes, and thank you. That that was a fine description. Um, this, this really, uh, I know people's eyes start to glaze over when we start to talk about bank capital, but these are basically requirements that require banks, especially large banks, to fund themselves with a minimum amount of equity uh, versus debt. And there are two ways to do that. Regulators use what's called a risk-based ratio. So they adjust the amount of capital required based on the supposed riskiness of assets. And there's a leverage ratio, which is not, which is, does not purport to adjust exposures based on risk, acknowledging that it's, it's really difficult to know what is truly risk, you know, has risk and does not have risk. Um, risk-based uh, measures of capital failed miserably during the great financial crisis when the assumption was that European sovereign debt and mortgages were low risk or zero risk, and they clearly were not. So what has happened now for the leverage ratio, uh, which is what, frankly, uh, it, the more binding constraint uh, when uh, a bank starts to take excessive risk, is, uh, is being weakened by removing certain assets from the denominator, right? So these are ratios. So there's a numerator on top, a denominator on the bottom, which includes what the bank's assets are. And uh, the Fed has taken, for one of the measures of leverage, they have taken out treasuries and well as well as monies that banks have on deposit at the Federal Reserve. So the argument for this is that these are risk-free assets, uh, so it's no big deal. Uh, but what that ends up doing, it's several bad things. It makes the capital levels uh, less transparent. Uh, thanks to Brian Chung's excellent analysis, uh, we discovered that the four biggest banks took about 1.6 trillion of assets out of their denominator that boosted uh, their leverage uh, measures by, uh, by, I think it was between 10 and 16%. So it's a, a, a considerable improvement in their leverage ratios just by taking assets out of the denominator. So they didn't raise any new capital. They just, uh, they just uh, um, changed the denominator. But it also, this will also skew incentive to put more money into treasuries at a time when we want banks to lend, which is counterintuitive, right? Because we want them to take some risk. The, the economy has credit needs. We want them uh, to be uh, meeting those credit needs. But ironically, uh, in terms of the impact of this change by the regulators, it, it didn't boost lending. Lending went down among the biggest banks. It went up with the small banks who aren't getting any relief under this because they're they're constrained by risk-based measures. The leverage ratio is really not a factor for them. So, Sheila, so, uh, to, to, yeah. to sum up what you're saying is they didn't really increase their capital ratios. They're not lending like they say they are, and they're able to do this because of the way they use the risk uh, ratios versus the leverage ratios. I know Brian, you, you yes, cited sir. what he pointed out, but Brian wants to get in on this too. Yeah, Adam, I mean, I guess to Sheila's point, she referenced my article. I mean, the data shows that banks, especially the largest banks, have not been necessarily increasing their lending despite uh, some of these regulatory tweaks here. You can find that on Yahoo Finance. But I guess I wanted to uh, ask Sheila as an extension of that, something that you have been very vocal about is that another way that you could address the underlying problem here, which is just trying to get more lending out there. You can talk about the regulatory ratios, yep. and it's a long discussion. But another way is just suspending some of these capital payments. The Fed has suspended uh, buybacks through the end of the third quarter, but they haven't necessarily clamped down on dividends. I'm wondering, what is your, uh, I guess, current read on that situation there? Uh, should the Federal Reserve and the regulators be clamping down on those types of capital distributions? Uh, yes, I, 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 that's been a long-standing position of mine, and I wish they'd done it earlier. Uh, as as uh, I indicated in my piece, uh, from from the dividends paid from the insured banks up to their holding companies, which then are distributed to to shareholders mostly, that was about thirty billion dollars. And even keeping the leverage constraints the way they are without any relief, you, you still have have leverage of about sixteen to one, which means if you keep that thirty billion dollars on bank balance sheets, you could expand. Uh, lending capacity by about a half a trillion dollars. So this is the way retaining that capital is another way to expand balance sheet capacity without weakening the bank. If you lower their capital uh, requirements, yes, that expands balance sheet capacity, but you're, you're weakening their financial position. So I do think 
it, it, it is just, uh, it, it, it confounds me why the Fed would be lowering capital standards at the same time allowing banks to pay dividends. If, for all they know, that capital leak will just go to the, to the benefit of shareholders as opposed to lending to the real economy, which is what we want. And, and, and in Britain and in uh, Europe, they have required banks to suspend uh, their dividends. I think we should have done that here. I'm, I'm hoping they are tightening up. As you notice, uh, they've been now, they were relying on voluntary measures before. They've suspended buybacks now. They're limiting dividends to as, as, a, as, a, um, as a function of past earnings, uh, which is good. So uh, there, there are some limits around it, but they're still paying significant dividends. And it looks like they're going to continue to let them do so. Hey, Sheila, it's Julie here. I want to take the conversation back to politics a little bit and the changes that we may be seeing um, should Joe Biden win in November. I know that you've come out in support of him. So potentially maybe some of the regulatory changes that you're talking about could could be happening or could get more scrutiny. In terms of who could be the chief at the Treasury of the folks who have been talked about, do you who do you think might be most likely or most effective Oh, <laughs> well, that's, there are a lot of there are a lot of fine people, a lot of good women. I hear names: uh, Leo Brader, uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin, uh, my friend Elizabeth Warren. Though I think Elizabeth's going to be very uh, very influential in the Senate. Um, so uh, there there's some outstanding candidates, many women candidates. Uh, I you know uh, I, I wish him well on that. Uh, the, the election hasn't been held yet. Uh, I, I do think, though, that the Fed is as important, if not more so, the vice chair's supervision of the Fed really uh, drives regulatory policy at this point, much more so than Treasury. So I, I would hope that um, an assessment of supervisory and regulatory policy over the past two years, which has been directionally to loosen our hard-fought uh, Dodd-Frank reforms uh, in a way that cumulatively, I think, has significantly weakened the protections we put in place after the great financial crisis. So I, I do hope if he is elected, he will take a fresh look at that. Even if he's not, I, I hope the current team will, will will take an assessment of what they're doing and reconsider, because I think really it's, it's the wrong move right now, given the severe economic distress uh, that our, our economy still faces. Uh, the, the Fed's becoming itself is becoming more pessimistic about our economic outlook. Uh, now is the time to conserve capital to support the economy. It's not time to be loosening regulations and paying out dividends. Yeah, and Sheila, to that point, it does seem interesting that uh, we were talking about that leverage ratio. The reason why we're talking about that is because there was that Senate proposal to slip that into any sort of phase four uh, negotiations in the next uh, relief package. But I guess I'm wondering, if we just throw all that aside, we look forward to the uh, election here. How important do you think financial regulation is going to be from the Biden campaign? We've heard some of his platforms oh. with regards to specifically more diversity at the financial regulators, but what types of policies right. could you see a Biden campaign enacting with respect to the Dodd-Frank framework and the way that banks are supervised right now? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure. I have a lot of respect uh, for Senator Vice I still call him Senator. I knew him back uh, in the 80s when I worked for Dole when he was on the Senate Judiciary Committee. You know, where he will be on this uh, is not clear to me. Um, I, I, I like to remind people that, you know, the influence of the financial sector has been very bipartisan. A lot of the deregulation that occurred that proved so damaging occurred under the Clinton administration, not under Republican administrations. So there's still a big influence in the, even in the Democratic Party, a big source of, of fundraising and donations. Um, so I, I will hold my breath and hope for the best. <laughs> that his administration will bring people in who are independent. And they don't need to be anti-bank. I'm not suggesting that, but really people who will exercise independence of judgment and understand that the, what the banks advocate is not necessarily the public interest. There's an inherent friction between banks, which are shareholder-owned, profit-driven entities, and public officials and regulators whose, whose mandate should be consumer protection and system stability. So there's an inherent tension there. And I just hope he appoints people who understand that and will be independent. Sheila Baer is Volcker Alliance Director, and I just want to give everybody the title of the column on the Yahoo Finance webpage. It is The Danger of Allowing Banks to Artificially Boost Capital Ratios. It is a good read if you want to dive deeper into this discussion. Sheila, all the best to you. Thank you for being here on The okay. Great joining you. Bye-bye.